Today's COVID update is brought to you by Fultech Systems, your technology center, where you'll come for the price, but stay for the service. And welcome back. We are about to get into our first conversation this morning. We have with us online Dr. Jorge Hidalgo. He's been a regular on our morning show in these COVID times, Marlene. Uh, this morning, we're going to be talking to Dr. Hidalgo about the opening up of the tourism sector. Uh, first of all, the PGIE and what that means from a health perspective. Good morning, Dr. Hidalgo. Good morning, good morning and, and thank you for having me. Let's begin by getting your first take on the announcement that was made on Thursday of last week where an official date has been set for the reopening of the Philip Goldson International Airport. Well, uh, that is uh, inevitable. No, we need to, we, at some point, we need to start uh, open our country. Of course, uh, in the way they are doing it, in, in, in a strategic way, we can open suddenly everything, but then we, uh, at some point, we need to start with uh, uh, step by step. No? I mean that uh, uh, we was thinking on, on 1st of July, and then now I think so, August, uh, I think we have enough time at least to know what is going on. You see how oh, the pandemic is behaving in other countries and, and also uh, what additional measures we can take uh, additional to what we know already. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I think we can, we can definitely um, look at the reopening of the airport um, in several aspects. There's, there's what's what it means for the tourism sector. Uh, there is looking at the protocol of, of how people arrive and how do you ensure the safest um, movement within the country. And then there's also looking at the preparation of our healthcare system. And, and that's really where I want to start because we have had a few months to be able to adjust and, and pay attention to the ongoing research that is taking place. Um, looking at where we were pre-COVID, to where we are now. What's your analysis as to how much we've progressed? Well, I think so. Uh, there are many things that are, are been happening, you know, and I think so the country it's, itself is trying to prepare and, and strengthen you know, mm -hmm. uh, the different areas of uh, what we need to uh, be prepared for an opening uh, like the airport. You know? yeah. uh, of course, uh, this one is a team effort. The on, only one person can do that, and we need to, to rely on, on, on everybody. It means that the, the international agencies that are bringing the, 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 the passengers, yeah. uh, the passengers itself, I think, so is the most responsible one. We need to be very, very reasonable uh, with ourselves and also uh, have a social responsibility in, 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 in that, uh, if it's the case, you know, because we can just come in, into a country knowing that we have symptoms. You know. Uh, uh, of course, when, uh, when we start uh, uh, some months ago, uh, and we can say that we are fortunate that we are not having the wave uh, and also the impact of COVID-19 as other countries, I think so uh, it, it has uh, given us an opportunity to prepare and also to, to, strat to, to uh, work on a strategy as for well to reopen the country slowly you know we can open the country suddenly because then we will trouble as you can see all the our neighboring countries like panama uh, even the united states you know? yeah and when you look at especially um i think the united states it, it makes us extremely worried um but I, i'm you know we look at some of the protocols that are established um for safety uh everywhere uh people well not everywhere but I'd imagine that traveling out of the United States and even coming into Belize, everyone will be subjected to certain things. Um, yes. The temperature check is one. Um, people are typically asked about whether or not they have uh, physical uh, symptoms, like, or obvious symptoms, I should say, like uh, cough, runny nose, sneezing. How much are these already kind of helping us at the start? if these, th these types of precautions are taken before they even fly into the country? 
that is a very interesting question, and I just was uh, reading an article as how the the uh, epidemic start in Germany, you know, and then uh, is a uh, this uh, uh, people from uh, a person uh, salesman from China came with no symptoms, and then he was uh, basically meeting with several people in, in in Germany to discuss different businesses, and then. Uh, Suddenly, some cases start to appear in Germany, and, and this patient was, was a completely asymptomatic, no symptoms at all. Mm -hmm. and then the, the patient, the, the person went back to China, and then when the person went back to China, then he called uh, Germany and tell the guys that the, the patient, he stuck with some symptoms. No? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean that, I just want to, to stress the fact also uh, the transmission for a symptomatic person is simply something that we need to have in account. And also, need to be able to trace those people that are coming into the country completely uh, asymptomatic. That way, in any case, if they start uh, also for, uh, a stress on them, and if they start with any minimal symptoms, they need to they need to let the public health services know. Of course. Uh, the, the, the measures taking the temperature are important as will allow us to recognize someone uh, uh, in early stages, but also we need to both think, take into account that some patients are going to be uh, silent carriers or completely mm -hmm. asymptomatic. Probably they're never going to develop any symptoms, but they are carriers. Mm -hmm. we're, we're past the point of fear-mongering when it comes to COVID-19. We've accepted it as part of our reality in present times. However, when you look at the idea of persons being asymptomatic, you really don't know who is next to you or around you or who you will come in contact with yeah. that is a carrier of this particular disease. And so it's, it's concerning on various levels because for the persons who are working at the front line, who are going to be receiving these visitors, and the persons in the general population who may very well come into contact with these individuals unknowingly, then it creates a situation that you know you, you really don't know what you're facing. Correct? That is correct, and that's why the importance of stressing on our on our general population and also to ourselves on the social distance measurements that you, you probably you can see already that many people are relaxing on those. Mm -hmm. uh, we are not there. You see people in the streets that they are not using, they are not wearing the mask properly, uh, they uncover the nose or they put the, the, the mask uh, uh, aside, I mean that they are, uh, and also those are things that we need to, to stress on, on those days, uh, especially uh, uh, come in August, we need to probably uh, do all the different, deliver again the new the information about social distancing and that we mm -hmm. can't relax at all. We need to be prepared those, those, uh, that, that time. Yeah, Dr. Hidalgo, I'm so glad you said that. I think that when you, when you consider um, what is necessary at this time, it seems that we have to go back to where we started which is kind of yes. talking about uh, hand washing obsessively and also the importance of keeping spaces and why we use face masks to protect other people and to some extent protect ourselves. Um, yeah. and, and I don't know how much, um, I mean clearly that, that is a necessary part of the step. But I, I wanted to come back to one of the questions that I hear very often which is how does an asymptomatic person transmit the virus? Because we hear all the time that it's done through, uh, it's transmitted through respiratory droplets. Um, so we know that, you know, if you cough and sneeze, we've all seen the videos, there's this projection of, mm -hmm. of droplets moving across the room. Um, now, how does it happen in an asymptomatic person? Just speaking, the, the, the saliva uh, have a, uh, we can transmit the virus to the saliva, that's why the, the six feet is important yeah. to, to distance. Uh, and also, uh, uh, if I'm asymptomatic, probably I'd be touching my nose or, 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 and also trying to uh, uh, shaking hands or touch you. Yeah. 
I mean that those things we need to need to stress. You know that uh, we need to uh, uh, to prevent those, and also if we are if we are touching nose on my face, I need to wash my hands immediately, and uh, making sure that uh, we keep in the social distance to prevent that uh, to tacking is is going to be enough for us to to, to uh, get infected. Social distancing continues to be one of the biggest challenges, though, because for whatever reason, perhaps it's the nature of how we are cultured as a people, for whatever reason, it's difficult for us to keep that prescribed six feet. You go to, you, you go to stores, for instance, you go anywhere in the public space and you see that people are bunched up on top of each other with no regard for, for keeping six feet, you know, distance in between individuals. Um, do you... Do you foresee that to remain an issue insofar as whatever new measures are put in place when the season opens? Well, remember that unfortunately it's, it's, it's our human nature to, mm -hmm. to oppose to everything. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> if, if, if you give at somebody certain type of rules, uh, we're trying to see how we can break the rules. Unfortunately, you know, that is a, a human nature. By, uh, and not only in Belize, it's everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. You, you see uh, in the in the U.S. You now with the riots and everything that they, and also even the the, the the political gatherings that they are not wearing masks properly mm -hmm. uh, uh, mean that uh, it's it's something uh, that is taking a for we want to oppose to to everything. But I think so. Uh, Belize, we are very lucky to don't have the the cases as other countries, and also we don't have patients in the hospital yeah. and also they are not having doctors dying like in, in our neighboring countries. No, I mean that I think so we have a, a unique position. We need to do whatever we can to preserve our position and, and the way we are right now. So when you look at it from, from a health perspective, what, what's currently being, um, uh, what is currently outlined to us as the protocol for people to enter the country um, when the airport is open is that you'd have to present a negative test uh, that has been done uh, within 70, 72 hours of travel. Um, not have to, you're encouraged. If you haven't, then there is what was described as a layered approach to rapid tests. It's very technical. There are two different types of tests that they explained. Um, talk to me about how, how much um, of a preventative measure you see this as from a medical perspective. Okay, uh, first of all, we need to recognize that unfortunately, as, and, and, and probably you are aware already, that the, the time of reporting a testing, it varies with country to country. Yes. Mm -hmm. Countries that are reporting the test in 10 days, 11 days, one week, I mean that uh, it's a factor, as, I, as again, as I start in the beginning, this reopening is, is, is a team effort. And, and we need to essentially work with the airlines to m trying to keep those measures in place. And as you know, IATA sometimes uh, at the beginning was opposed to, to testing at the uh, entry of the pass passenger. No? Yeah. I mean, that it's a negotiation that the, the, the different airlines and government need to have with them for them to uh, uh, adhere to those rules, those regulations. Uh, it's going to be challenged to, to be able to have a test in 72 hours. Mm -hmm. but also, uh, is this the rules? Then, uh, as uh, we were discussing this morning, it's a match. We, 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 this is of rules, and whatever person is want to come, they need to adhere to the rules yeah. in order to protect our country. And again, it's not in terms in terms of test. It's still challenging everywhere. We don't have uh, at this at this point any rapid test been approved and with the sensi sen sensibility and sensitivity we would like, I mean that uh, uh, we would need to rely on that and also, uh, as I mentioned, uh, also rely on the person that coming to the point to, to say if he have you know, any symptoms or, or, or the different conduct. At this stage, everyone who is coming to the country, everywhere, we need to assume that are, we need to assume that are positive. That's, I think so that's the best thing. Mm -hmm. That is the most, yeah, th that is such an important thing to say because I, I think that, that at some point in time, um, we will have to, even amongst each other, just assume 
that everyone has COVID and keep the proper distance and, and protocols in place. And exactly. Yeah. Let's 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 talk about um, the the current treatment that is available or what the plan is um, from the hospital perspectives. So the tourist sites specifically don't have fully functional hospitals. Um, they have polyclinics. So uh, like in San Pedro, for example, Key Cocker, um, Placentia, uh, these areas don't have the level of care that you can get um, on the mainland. So let's talk about uh, what type of efforts you would like to see, especially as a critical care specialist, because you know the intensive level of care a severe case will require. Yeah, well, as we as, as, uh, mentioned, we need to, the, since this is an, an, an strategy, the strategy includes strengthening the medical facilities. Yes. Uh, at at, uh, at uh, even polyclinics, but as well as at the hospital level, and that's what is happening you now. Uh, we are conducting uh, trainings uh, or start to conducting trainings for the doctor that's going to be. Uh, most exposed to, to the COVID-19 patients in, in, in the ICU. The uh, Calhoun Union have a strategy already. It's a, it's a place already in place, but also uh, is uh, a, a, an area that needs, that uh, can be expanded in case uh, we have uh, an increased number of cases. Hopefully it's not the case, you know, but uh, all the different measures and equipment that uh, mini, the, the equipment that is needed because right now, unfortunately, the treatment is supported. We need to, yes. to essentially uh, put all efforts to support the patients uh, because there are no, uh, at this stage, uh, a definite treatment. We, we know that we can use remdesivir as an antiviral uh, and uh, I believe it's, it's an effort making, trying to acquire the medication that we have it but that we can have available in the country, uh, and also some medications, like we call it uh, immune modulator, that essentially regulate the immune system response, uh, and some simple ones that are available uh, in the country, that, like the esteroids, like the hexamethasone, has been approved recently, that uh, uh, we can use it in, in those type of cases. Yeah. In, uh, Again, this one is a team effort, and every team needs to be uh, thinking on opening on Agos, and, and that that that, uh, that includes strengthen, strengthening the medical facilities. What's what's the capacity um, at the Carl Hushner for well, COVID-19 uh, hospitalized cases? Uh, the immediate unit have six beds, mm -hmm. uh, uh, fully equipped, and then. Uh, they have the expansion to open over regular IC, uh, over other ICUs that have uh, in total between 10 to 20 additional beds that can be used as an ICU, it is the case. Of course, everything uh, is not only equipment, but also the, the proper uh, training personnel yeah. that we need, to, we need to work with. Well, you beat me to that question, Doc, <laughs> because... Uh, that was the question I was going to ask. This is this is some really specialized care um, when yeah. when people move into that very severe uh, form of COVID nineteen. Um, a critical care specialist like yourself um, are usually the head of the team. What what is our our human resource capacity? Well, uh, uh, that's a good question. No, uh, the, as you know, uh, there are only three critical care specialists in the country. Dr. Fernando Cuellar, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Arriaga, and myself. I mean that we, the three of us are essentially working together since uh, the beginning of the pandemic, mm -hmm. trying to uh, work on protocols, on a strategy, also on, on, on telemedicine, because of course the three of us uh, can- You're in Felicity. Yeah. yeah. I mean that we yeah. need to, to uh, also work with telemedicine to uh, guide uh, the people that are we, that we in, in case that we are not available no? mm -hmm. uh, I mean that uh, it's, a, it's a good in, in a way uh, good experience because we, we we are together working on that and also uh, dr francis Murray from the ministry of health is very very helpful mm -hmm. facilitating us let's stick up in there for a second and 
Describe for us the idea or the concept of telemedicine in a case, for instance, where you're in Belize City, but there is an outbreak in Punta Gorda, let's say. How does that work in that particular context? Well, most important thing, uh, we, we need to assume that the patient is going to be confined in a, in a, in a, in a special unit. No? Mm -hmm. uh, and then it will depend on, uh, we, we can do telemedicine with cameras. We have uh, set up our cameras in a, in a, in a COVID-19 unit at Cal Kirchner uh, as well. Uh, uh, and with the idea that we'll be able to, to see the patient, to, uh, to mm -hmm. be able to interact nurses that are working with the patient yeah. uh, and also to be able to see the monitor uh, the patient first then the monitor and the different equipment uh, in case of any any there are any anything that we need to uh, discuss with the nurses and also to make some changes in the way how the management is going yeah. but most importantly patients like COVID-19 is a moderate or, or severe case this patient needs to be treated immediately to a facility that be able to handle the severity of those cases, but also, most importantly, to prevent for the patient to reach an unstable stage. Yeah. Well, and, and, and so let's talk about that. What are we seeing now in, in COVID-19? Um, and of course, we're looking at data. You, you, keep, you are a part of a network of critical care specialists around the yes. world. So they're able to tell you how the cases are presenting, um, how quickly it becomes a severe situation. What do we know so far about the development of the disease itself? Well, it's, it's very unfortunate that, that, that we need to, we're still learning a lot. And as, as you can see uh, what happened in the, in the US, but also let's talk about our neighbor country because I think so this is our reality. Yeah. You can see what is happening in, in Guatemala. No, Guatemala, of an, 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 a very high number of cases, uh, and also uh, almost every day you see a report of one of uh, uh, a doctor that is dying due to the COVID-19. Uh, same thing is happening in Panama, uh, and also uh, El Salvador, where they just opened a huge facility, mm -hmm. yeah. the, uh, uh, state of the art facility, but. Unfortunately, they, they don't have the, 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 all the personal, the trained personnel to, to manage a, a hospital that size. The numbers are increasing badly. Uh, of course, we have uh, many, uh, we need to essentially be careful with the, the, uh, what we mentioned at the beginning, the, the, the asymptomatic carriers, because uh, especially those patients that are with some comorbidities like diabetes, uh, obese, uh, heart, heart issues, kidney problems, patients that are undergoing any type of uh, uh, cancer treatment, those are vulnerable population and we need to be uh, stressed on those uh, aspects to prevent. Yeah. Uh, we also have a network with, with uh, we, we just joined with uh, the Caribbean English speaking countries and also we are communicating with them to see what is happening in, 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 in the Caribbean. Yeah. Uh, we have a and in South America, probably the, the countries that are more affected are Peru and, and Ecuador, and yeah. we are in with them. Yeah, you know, I, I think that's such an interesting um, when you when you talk about what's happening, especially in the Caribbean versus Central America. Sometimes it, it leads us to believe that maybe we just have a, a bit more resilience to to the disease than others do because we didn't see the large number of cases. When you hear things like that, doctor, how would you? How would you explain to people the risks that we do possess in country? Well, you know, despite of everything, we, we the, the country is 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 is, is uh, close, no? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, that uh, in a way it helps us a lot to to get those cases from our neighboring countries like Mexico, Honduras, and Guatemala. No? Uh, I know that that uh, probably. Some of them, once in a while, they try to cross in, in, in the blind spots in the borders. But uh, gladly that the 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 our guys are able to to get got those people. No, yeah. uh, mean that I think so. That's that's the explanation because uh, like Panama, they close the country and they trying to reopen the country, and then they suddenly have this uh, increased number of cases. Yeah. 
happened with Costa Rica. Despite that, Costa Rica is doing very well. Uh, they they experience the same issue. They they start to reopen the country and then they see uh, numbers of cases to raise, you know? and they start again to, to to put some measures in place as well as Panama and the country. You know? I mean that we are, we are a country that we are really blessed. Yeah. And I for hopefully the population uh, and all of us can have this uh, social responsibility. Uh, because when I say, if I'm wearing a mask, I'm not wearing the mask to protect myself. I'm wearing a mask to protect you. Yeah. And, 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 and in a way, this is like the different code of ethics. No? If mm -hmm. I'm respectful to you, I'm expecting the same from you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, Dr. Hidalgo, we do have uh, more to talk about. So what I'm going to do is take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll talk more about uh, the health perspective of the reopening of the country. So please, stay tuned. No problem. Okay, they weren't ready for the break. When someone you love becomes a memory, the memory becomes a treasure. Channel 5 introduces the Daily Obituaries. The daily obituaries will broadcast all death and funeral announcements and memorials to honor your loved one's life and memories. The daily obituaries airs on Channel 5 prior to the evening newscast with subsequent repeats at 10 p.m. and 12 noon the following day. It will also be placed online on our social media platforms, all for a standard package fee. Celebrate their lives and memories with Channel 5's daily obituaries. Honor in life and reverence in death. are continuing our conversation all the talk about the reopening of the airport uh, we've been focused a lot on tourism we wanted to be able to have a, a broad discussion about the health perspective what are some of the things that we need to do here in Belize what are some of the things that we're expecting um, will be implemented in the process of people entering and leaving the country and how prepared is our healthcare system so here having this conversation with us uh, is Dr. Jorge Hidalgo, uh, and uh, we spoke about quite a bit in terms of a symptomatic transmission um, and just briefly started the conversation about the preparedness of the healthcare sector. Dr. Hidalgo, before the break, you mentioned that in Belize, we currently only have three critical care specialists. These are uh, doctors that are specialized to work in intensive care um, situations. And the three... The three are concentrated in the Belize uh, city specifically. Now, in the first wave of COVID-19, we saw that one case had exposed both you and Dr. Ariaga, two of the three <laughs> critical care specialists. And I think that that is definitely a concerning situation moving forward. What's been done to ensure that a situation like that doesn't happen again, where you and uh, Dr. Ariaga or any other doctor are confined for 14 days because of exposure. Yes, um, that's, a, that, that's a good point, you know, uh, and that's why, uh, as I told you, Dr. Cuellar, Dr. Ariaga and myself, mm -hmm. uh, we are working together. We have the, the, the telemedicine system set up at, 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 uh, in Cal Huesner. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that way, uh, even if we are in the hotel confined, we can be able, we are able to continue working with the patients and, and, and with the team that is working uh, dedicatedly in the COVID-19 unit. I mean that that's as a, an important step that we did, okay. and also uh, uh, and thinking on that also, Dr. Francis Murray uh, from the Ministry of Health is trying to uh, set up a, a, a similar system in, in Belmopan. That uh, we we already have a, an interaction with the. The different doctors in the country okay. via WhatsApp, okay. uh, but uh, being Belmopan, the capital, uh, Dr. Mori, along with the Ministry of Health, they are trying to to set up uh, a, a unit in Belmopan that also will be able to help uh, and assist via telemedicine. Mm -hmm. When you look at the existing infrastructure, so to speak. 
in terms of the continued response and the preparedness. You're looking from Corozal to Punta Gorda. Do you believe that at present we have the sufficient units in place, the requisite number of human resources? What would be your assessment of what you see so far? Well, unfortunately, the, the COVID-19 put uh, essentially uh, our health system, and not only in Belize, around the world in a test. Hmm. And, 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 and as you can see, even the most sophisticated health systems that yeah. we, we, we thought at the, in, in, at the end of 2019, like the European countries like Belgium, Italy, mm. uh, Spain, that we, we, we tied on those health systems that are really strong. Uh, but as you, you see, they, they, uh, we are vulnerable yeah. uh, and system collapse. Uh, I mean that uh, we are doing the best we can. Is, is, uh, we can say there are things that are ideally, the ideal situation, but also we need to be pragmatic at what we have. And we need to be also very uh, honest on that. You know? Uh, in that sense, uh, the government are they are doing all the, the best they can, and I think so they have the different units, and we are working, uh, especially Corozal. They have a case that uh, that uh, they manage over there. The case wasn't severe, and, and, and they handled it very well. I mean that that's that's a, that's a good because uh, it's a good sign, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I mean that, that I mean that uh, of course this is not recent case. No, was uh, yeah. when we have wave. One uh, from the first wave, yes. yes, yes. <laughs> uh, but in the sense that that, that uh, gives you the, the sense that they, they, they are doing uh, the best effort. No? And of course, what? again, uh, one thing is to have the ideal system, and that the other thing is we need to work with what we have and, 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 and strengthen it. Yeah. And, and, you know, I appreciate that you say that because I was watching for this this weekend, for example, when uh, Texas reached its 100% capacity uh, mm -hmm. um, for healthcare, and and it's actually you know a lot of people go to Houston or they go to Texas for healthcare because they're so well known for it. That's kind of um, their hallmark, and so it's it's not only the quality of care; it's also capacity. It's literally that some people just take so long to recover that your beds are filled and mm -hmm. they're filled for a long time. Um, you know, you're aware because you've worked at, at, at KHMH for so long um, that the public doesn't always have full trust in the public healthcare system. Um, and uh, part of what we saw in the first wave was where people tried to access care first in a private institution and then they're moved over to a public institution what do you think needs to be done to ensure that there is more um, uh, synchronicity between the public and private healthcare system so we don't have situations like we saw in the first wave? Yeah, well, we are working on that. It's not easy, no. Uh, but uh, I think so, uh, as uh, we all would say, and, and, and you, you, uh, this is a team effort. This is something that we are going to find if we are united, if we are separate. Definitely, we are not going to have any luck. Mm -hmm. But uh, what we are trying to do is, is to get together as a group. Actually, one of the, the, the strategies that the Ministry of Health put in place is that we have every day, uh, from the month of April, we have a, a, every day a continual medical education, uh, one hour at midday. Mm -hmm. uh, then in May and June, due to the, the, the cases reduced, then we are having a continual medical education uh, three times a week, one hour at midday. Yeah. Uh, that, is, that allows us to interact, uh, put in, uh, some points in the, into discussion with the, with the whole country of Belize. That's a good thing. And also, uh, the, 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 one of the things is that uh, some of the countries, neighboring countries, ask us to join us. I mean, that we have people every day from Peru, from Ecuador, uh, from uh, the English Caribbean countries. And they also uh, help us to put in perspective what is happening in health system in the areas and also uh, with our health system. And that uh, is some elements that we use to improve. Mm -hmm. Now, 
there are still some naysayers out there who say, you know, we're making a big deal over something that's just like a flu. <laughs> and uh, even perhaps going as far as saying, well, it'll only affect the elderly population. From your analysis, what's, what's the, the risk factors um, that will matter the most for us here in Belize? Well, uh, with COVID-19, all of us are, are vulnerable and in a risk. Yeah. From, from that. And if you probably remember at the very beginning of the pandemic, we say, oh, it's only elderly patients. And as Italy and Spain uh, was saying, you know, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, as the condition progressed, we noticed that uh, in some countries, actually the, 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 the most uh, vulnerable population are the population between 30 to 50 years old. Mm -hmm. And in some other countries, they start to report that some children are getting affected as well as COVID-19, not as much as in the adult population, but we've seen also children being uh, affected. And also, as you mentioned, um, they, even their experience or they are believed they are triggering this condition that we call it a, a Kawasaki disease, who essentially is a, 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 an inflammatory uh, condition, very disorganized and very robust that affects some kids, no, no, not everyone, but yeah. some kids are yeah, vulnerable to that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that actually was going to be my next question, because we are looking forward to at uh, the opening of school on April 10th. I know, you know you're a dad. Um, and if you have young children, I think the older ones can understand. Who I hear the most concern from are parents who have preschool age children, um, trying to imagine them understanding that life at school won't be the same and you won't be able to play, share food, wear a mask. Uh, what are your thoughts on, on the reopening of the physical school structure? Well. They need to be open, and of course, it's, a, it's going to be a, a, a challenge for them, especially for the for the the small kids, you know, because yeah. you know uh, we are trying. We, we share everything. We share. Yeah. Uh, I mean that that that's going to be a, a, a very very challenge. But we need to do it. You no, know? yeah. uh, unfortunately, uh, we can uh, stay just like that forever. You no, know? at some yeah. point, we need to 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 do the exercise and reopening. And of course, as in other countries, if we see the raise on number of cases, then we need to go back and close the country again, uh, as other, other countries are doing. Yeah, yeah. And as you said, children still, even though we've been hearing of this new rare disease that seems to be appearing, a very small number, we must say, um, in, in, in some areas where there were outbreaks, in terms of fatalities, um, children don't get that severely affected. The the, the numbers of children dying for the COVID nineteen, of course, is fortunate is not bad. No, yeah. it's most. Uh, 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 if of course, it will depend again in the uh, the timing. You know, timing is important. I mean that if you start with minimal symptoms, you must go and seek medical attention. Unfortunate, as you can probably, as uh, you guys know. It is uh, uh, there are uh, certain uh, I can say like uh, like paranoia and also uh -huh. stigma. Uh, stigma and discrimination on those patients that are are positive. You no, know, it's like oh you are positive then uh, you are bad or I don't, uh, yeah. and I, I don't want to be with you things like that. No, yep. uh, uh, but I think so. It's a learning process. We need to learn how to 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 essentially. Uh, interact each other and even on those circumstances because then the people are going to be more uh, it's going to be more easy for them to, to accept that they are experiencing symptoms but what happened right now is that if you have symptoms probably you are trying to hide it you yeah. were trying to home and, and don't say anything and stay there because uh, the, the, the other people <coughs> especially if you are if it's your neighbor no yeah. unfortunately but we need to, it's, 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 a, it's a very challenge. We need to learn how to, to live with it and how to, to essentially interact with each other yeah. and let's, make it comfortable. No? Let's go back a little bit. Uh, Marlene mentioned some of the concerns arising out of the reopening of schools on August 10th. From a medical perspective, 
what are some of the basic measures that can be implemented at the classroom level? Uh, well, first of all, the, 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 we, we need to make sure that everybody is wearing masks properly, washing the hands, uh, and of course, keeping the, 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 the distance among each other. No? That is going to be a little bit challenge, but we need to make the effort to, to do that. No? Uh, I mean, uh, those probably are the, are the most important things that we need to stress. Simple measures. We don't probably need to do nothing uh, sophisticated, but if we are able to do the simple measure, it will help us a lot. When you look at a public school, for instance, right, and you look at a classroom that, that can hold as many as 30 students, you're looking at a physical space that may not necessarily give you six feet in any direction. So, so trying to abide by that within a confined space is in and of itself a challenge. Would you, yes. would you accept that as so? Well, uh, there are things that we need to, we need to try to work with. Mm -hmm. But as I'm saying, if a simple thing that wearing the mask is, mm -hmm. is going to be help us a lot. I mean that, but it's very difficult as, as, as even if we, as an adult and, and also knowing all the different risks, you see again, you see in the streets, you see in the supermarkets that people go, or, or if you go to, to a restaurant right now, you used to get some food, you will see that people enter into the restaurant with kids and, and the adult without mask. Mm -hmm. Just because they say, okay, I, it's, it's going to be very, very briefly just get out from vehicle and get the food, but yeah. those, simple those minimal times is going to be enough for you to get infected i mean yeah. that i think so we need to stress on, on, on our social responsibility mm -hmm. the country and the government have a have a, a, a responsibility but i don't know i don't know how much loving this yeah. i don't know how much things have changed um in the public school setting but i do know that there are certain things that are customary so to speak. Uh, let's say, for instance, on Monday mornings, you have the, the raising of the flag, the national, the, the national prayer, and the, the anthem, and that sort of stuff. You also do have lines that are formed before the bell rings, or at the point where the bell rings for students to go into class. We're looking at scenarios where, you know, those challenges are physically there. You, you're looking at kids who it's going to be an issue to control, you know, them in those confined or particular spaces. And we're, we're saying social distancing is mandatory if we're going to be able to relax all other measures. It's, 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 it's going to be a challenge, but it's a learning process. Mm -hmm. We need to learn and we need to uh, definitely take the, the... The most important thing is that we need to be able to recognize the things that we are doing, but quickly to be able to, to, to fix it and, and also to, to put all different uh, measures in place. But it's not, uh, again, as you say, it's not going to be easy, but it needs to be done. We need, we need to, we need to uh, I think, so restart the schools and, and trying to live. And we adapt as we go along. Dr. Yes. Dr. Dalgo, let me just, you know, you said something critical and I think I've heard it, you know, from so many different uh, health organizations from the WHO uh, to the U.S. health officials, which is just let's start functioning like every person you interact with possibly has COVID-19 um, and protect yourself accordingly. One of the things about um, the reopening, and I want to get your insight because I know you, you have a very able uh, a mind next to you as well <laughs> um, about the rapid tests. If someone doesn't have a PCR negative test result and enters into the country asymptomatic and they take the two rapid tests as uh, will be required, uh, you know, and they're negative, let me say that. I mean, should we still function that this person may possibly be positive? Yes. Because unfortunately, at this at this stage, we still not have a, a, a rapid test uh, approved. Uh, mean that we need to assume yeah. that uh, even at this negative, 
we need to we need to assume that uh, it's a potential case and we need to treat it like that with and, and, and he needs to essentially we need to give the recommendations to adhere to different measures that we have and also uh, at, at any point in time if, if they start with minimal symptoms that they need to to report immediately and and make the pe the people feel confident that we are going to treat the information as confidential as probably they want of but uh, we, need to, we need to ensure that the uh, unfortunate rapid tests at this stage mm -hmm. things can are changing very and this condition is very dynamic as you can see I mean that uh, and there are many many companies working and hopefully we can have uh, sooner or later a reliable rapid test uh, we have some rapid test PCR that can deliver the information in in, in short period of time, uh, like fif uh, 15 uh, minutes. But of course, this is not available in in, in Belize. Uh, but it's some it's a technology that is this is is available. And but unfortunately, as you know, uh, this is Abbott technology, and they are restricted to sell it outside. Yeah. So um even with the layered approach that they're talking about, you take one rapid test and then another, um, that's not enough to be able to be sure of someone's status. Unfortunately, they are, they are not 100% in medicine. Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, we, need to, we, need to, we, need to, we need to work based on that. And, and with the, uh, again, there are no rapid tests at this point that can give you and can deliver you 100% results. As even the PCRs give you 99% reliability, depend again timing is important. Mm -hmm. We need to know exactly at what time. Uh, of course, the, the the incubation period varies. Someone can have uh, probably entered the country completely asymptomatic, and and we do the test it, and then a couple of days after that depends on on on, on the, the the incubation incubation period. Then probably they will start with some symptoms even with two positive rapid test negative. Wow, okay. And from a health standpoint, you know, we, we understand that um, our frontline workers and, and really the people who are going to be um, fighting any situation, if it does reach to the point where we have an outbreak, it's gonna be you and your medical team. So if you were to say that you're paying attention to one particular aspect of the reopening, what would that be? What, where is your area of concern? My area of concern of reopening is uh, essentially the, mm -hmm. again, it's a team effort. And, and yeah. if something uh, fails in that change of uh, a command, if we can say like that, or in, in the change of measure we are taking, we were, we were taking, then we will be in trouble. No? I mean, that we need to make sure that this one is, an, uh, is strategized properly uh, with all the players seriously involved uh, uh, for this to function. And I believe if, if, if all the players are in place and, 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 and doing the job that is, uh, is required, I think so is, is going to be good again. But if for some reason uh, uh, some of the players fail, then we'll be in trouble. Yeah. All right. Well, Dr. Dago, we really appreciate you uh, sharing uh, this information with us this morning and discussing uh, some of the areas that we all need to be paying attention to. And lastly, once again, it's a collective responsibility. So we look at what government is uh, making decisions to do. We're talking about the healthcare sector and how prepared you guys are. So why don't you remind us about our responsibility as the wider public? Yes, uh, as, as a society, we have a, 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 a social responsibility uh, and we need to have in mind that we need to wear our mask properly and i will give you an example this is my mask uh -huh. mm -hmm. and we need to we need to wear it properly but as you can see and i will touch the yeah. mask just to give an example some people wear the mask like this mm -hmm. it's exposed mm -hmm. some other people put mask like yeah. here mm -hmm. yeah you know only probably because they are afraid for the police Mm -hmm. and the penalties, but no, we need to be, if I'm wearing my mask, I'm wearing it because I'm protect you. Yep. Yeah. And then I, I, will, I will expect that you do the same for me. Yeah. See, that social responsibility and your mask properly was enhanced as much as, as, much as possible. Yeah. 
uh, and as needed. And hopefully we can continue having uh, the country like, like we are right now. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Adago. You guys take care and thank you for the invitation. No problem. There you had it, uh, a very thorough conversation there talking about the health perspective of the reopening. Um, you know, I think that one of the messages that just is very clear is that we can't drop the ball uh -huh. on this. Um, we, uh, I, I, what I gather from the conversation is that, you know, the healthcare system will never be adequately prepared yeah. um, for a major outbreak. Um, and so it will be a collective responsibility from those who implement the protocols at the airport to the rest of us as we move around society. Um, and, and I know many doctors and many healthcare professionals have complained about how people use masks. Yeah, mask um, Yeah, and, uh, but I think one of the things I, I, we do have to remind people is that, you know, we, there are ways that we can protect ourselves. You know, especially if you're fearful, if you, if you pay attention to what's happening, you're thinking, oh my gosh, you know, I'm gonna get it. Think of the control factor that you do have. If yeah. you wear your mask, um, that's some level of protection for yourself and protection for others. Make sure people wear masks around you. Mm -hmm. um, keep you six feet uh, social, social distance, distance as best as you can. Yes, in some confined spaces, it's not exactly six feet, but you do the best you can to keep space between mm -hmm. people. And most importantly, wash your hands. Wash your hands wash as often as, as often. you can. You touch your face, you wash your hands. You touch a surface, you, you know, as often as you can. That's one of the ways that you can help to control to protect yourself. All right, but we got to go ahead and take a break now. And when we return, it's to have our conversation with the folks from the IDB and the World Tourism Organization. Stick around. This COVID update was brought to you by Foltex Systems. Your technology center, where you'll come for the price, but stay for the service. <laughs>